Well, will you look at this? It seems that H Bomber Guy. It's over. Yes, that one. Added one of my videos to the favorites playlist on his YouTube channel page. Well, someone added it to that playlist anyway. And honestly, just the possibility that H Bomber Guy watched and approved of something I did pretty much made my day, week, month, year, decade. Of course, it's a pretty eclectic bunch of videos on that playlist. King Crimson, Kratom, I had no idea what that was. Some animation and sound design stuff, two videos about dioramas of unlikely pop culture moments, a banjo cover of the Hitchhiker's Guide theme, a barking muntjack, and a horde of guinea pigs. Well, whatever, I'm honoured to be in their company. Although I am wondering if maybe my addition to that list means I'm about to be the subject of a 5 hour long H Bomber Guy takedown video, maybe something entitled The Most Boring Old Farts on YouTube, and at the 2 hour mark he does a fake out ending then turns to camera and says something like, that's right, this video is about the most boring ancient fart on YouTube, doddering old man. Honestly though, I still think that would be pretty cool. Anyway, this has nothing to do with the subject of today's video, I just wanted to brag. Seriously, I've been telling everyone I know, and everyone I don't know. I've been stopping strangers on the street to tell them that H-Bomber guy I see you, you little pedant. Yes, that one. May possibly have watched one of my videos. Huh. Well, okay then. I just checked and it turns out that in the 24 hours since I wrote this opening section, that whole playlist has been deleted. Or maybe it's just been made private. Whatever the case may be, I can't see it anymore and the dozen or so views a day I was getting from it have stopped. Which is a shame I guess, but honestly the only thing I really care about is the chance that the great man himself JUST ONE SMALL PROBLEM! Yes, that one. Might have watched something I made. Oh well, with that out of the way, let's get on to today's game. What is a role-playing game? I remember being surprised to discover this is something some people actually argue about quite fervently. There is an argument to be made that a game cannot truly be a role-playing game unless it requires you to fully immerse yourself in deep and sophisticated ways into the role you play in the game. And hey, it's tough to argue with that. It is, after all, what the name would suggest. These people might define something like Disco Elysium with its complex story, nuanced characters and branching dialogue as a role-playing game, but would probably say that most JRPGs aren't really worthy of the genre. Me though, I'm not that sophisticated. I'm too dumb for arguments like that. For my money, an RPG is a game where you increase your power by making numbers go up, and usually there's a focus on narrative. I will admit this is a somewhat problematic definition these days, as just about every game released in the last decade has numbers that go up, but who really cares, it's just semantics. Well, some people care a lot, and you know, that's fine. Me personally, I just cannot bring myself to care. All I know is, when I went to buy Heroes Quest, later known as Quest for Glory due to copyright issues, I was told by the guy in the computer shop that, as it was an RPG, it might be too complicated for my little 10 year old brain. I didn't know what an RPG was by any definition at that point, but the fact that I was being warned off it, that my childish intellect was being challenged, made me all the more determined to buy it. And so I did. Well, my mother bought it for me. I was only 10, I didn't have much money of my own. So, was the guy in the computer shop right? Was it too much for my feeble brain? Well, yes and no. It is true that the game baffled me, but that wasn't down to the RPG elements, which were actually rather basic and easy to grasp. Instead, the game was confusing and ultimately defeated me simply because it was a game made by Sierra in the 80s, and those things were notorious for being inscrutable and nigh on impossible to figure out without some sort of external assistance. Even by the tender age of 10, I was a veteran of Sierra Adventure games, having made my slow, agonizing way through Space Quest 3 and King's Quest 4. Except I hadn't made my way to the end of either of those games, at least not without help. We ended up ordering hint books for both of them, which is what you had to do back in those pre-internet days. We had to get them shipped from the United States, which was both expensive and slow, but to me at least it was worth it. So I wasn't exactly expecting Hero's Quest to be a walk in the park. And it wasn't. Months went by, I made some progress, but not much. So, inevitably, another hint book was ordered. It arrived. I rejoiced. I finished the game. I rejoiced again. That was 30 years ago. Or more. Now it's time to go back and have another look at the first RPG I ever played. First though, there's a choice to be made. Do I want to play the original EGA version released in 1989, or the VGA remake from 1992? 
Both those years might seem equally ancient to the young whippersnappers of today, but there is actually a fair bit of difference between the two versions, and it's more than just the graphics that have changed. The VGA version has a mouse-based interface, and it does away with the text commands of the earlier version, and that's really what makes the decision for me. I know I'm a curmudgeonly old stick in the mud, but as far as I'm concerned, unless you can type look at tree, ask about wizard, and punch sheriff in face, you're not truly playing an old school Sierra game. So the EGA version it is. And actually, even this version with its 16 colours is a damn sight prettier than how I originally played this game. My PC was basically obsolete before I got it. It could only handle CGA graphics, which meant four colours at a 320 by 200 resolution. So basically a step up from black and white, but not much of a step. You start by choosing your class, and this is a surprisingly significant choice, by the standards of the day at least. There are three classes, the fighter, the magic user, and the thief, and there are certain parts of the game that play out quite differently depending on which one you choose. More on that later. For now, I'm going with the fighter, because honestly he's the only one where the RPG side of things comes to the fore. And actually, right at the start you get maybe the strongest taste of what this game has to offer RPG-wise. Once you've picked your class, you get to allocate stat points. It's pretty simple stuff. As a fighter, you'll want to add points to strength, weapon use and vitality, while mages will make better use of intelligence and magic, and thieves favour agility and stealth. It all fits the standard RPG archetypes. And then it's into the game. For anyone familiar with Sierra games from the 80s, such as myself, this would have all looked very familiar, from the simple text boxes to the graphical style to the score tally in the top right. This was the age of the text parser. Uh, basic character movements were done with the arrow keys, but if you want to actually interact with anything, you have to type in a command. The game recognises a number of verbs and nouns, with the most useful things you can do being to look at things and to ask about whatever piques your curiosity. Doing this uh, not only fills you in on your surroundings and the people around you, but also often gives you hints about what items you can interact with. The game world itself is made up of a series of largely static screens, some of which have characters you can converse with, and it's not a big game world even by the standards of the day. You start off in the town of Spielberg, the only real town in the game, and it consists of four outdoor screens, a dingy alley, and four interiors, plus a couple of other interior areas if you're playing as a thief and can use the lockpicking skill. Outside the town there are maybe 50 or 60 screens of wilderness, mountains, and points of interest, which might sound like a fair few for a game like this, but most of the wilderness screens consist of a samey forested landscape and don't contain much of anything else other than fairly frequent random enemy encounters. So the game's not huge, but it was still of an impressive scale by the standards of the day, and it's a very open environment that's fun to explore at your leisure. Well, it was 30 years ago anyway. But for me now, even though it's been a hell of a long time since I played Heroes Quest, I still have pretty clear memories of where everything is and at least a vague idea of the intended path through the game. I remember, for instance, that one of the first things you want to do is find the healer's lost ring, a simple side quest that gives you a substantial cash reward and a couple of healing potions which are extremely useful to a fighter. And simple though it is, it gives one of the best examples of how the different classes can approach the game. The ring has been stolen by the healer's bird companion, so you need to get it from the nest. A fighter can pick up rocks and throw them at the nest to knock it down. A magic user can buy the fetch spell and use it to bring the nest right into their hands. A thief can climb the tree and simply pick up the ring where it lies. Basic stuff, but to my ten year old mind this was sophisticated content and it really kind of was for the time. And actually, because of the way the skill system works, you're not necessarily restricted by your class. It's true that in this case only the magic user can pick the magic option, but any character class can eventually succeed in either climbing the tree or knocking down the nest with rocks. You see, in this game you improve your skills by actually using them, which is an RPG trope that I would honestly like to see used more often even today. So if you can be bothered standing there for ages as a magic user hurling rocks through the air until you manage to increase your throwing skill enough to actually hit the damn nest, you can do that. Likewise, you can just type climb tree over and over until eventually you'll manage to scramble up. There really is quite a lot of potential for versatility. That said, not much of that potential is ever actually realised. This is, after all, a game from the 80s. It fit on four floppy disks. It was never going to contain a universe full of divergent, emergent gameplay. In truth, this simple ring-finding side quest is one of the few parts of the game that can be overcome several different ways. Nevertheless, just knowing that there was stuff like this in the game gave it plenty of replayability, and finding those moments where different classes could travel alternate paths was always cool. 
but the biggest draw of the game, the thing that kept me entertained the longest, was the combat. And it's the combat that is the reason the fighter is my favourite class. And look, I'll just say it now, the combat is trash. I didn't realise it at the time because I'd never seen anything like it, but yeah, it sucks. It is literally true to say that any enemy you fight in the game can be defeated just by hammering the attack button. Yes, the fighter can parry and dodge, and even has skills associated with those abilities that gain points as you use them, but if there's a way to use them effectively, I never found it. I never needed to. If you just keep on attacking, whatever's standing in front of you will die eventually. Or not. Quite often you'll die instead. When you first enter the wilderness, you'll encounter three types of enemies. Goblins, Sauruses, uh, Sauri, and Brigands. So long as you start the fight with full health, you'll almost certainly be able to kill goblins and sauruses before they kill you, unless you get unlucky and miss too many attacks. Brigands on the other hand are tougher, and until you increase some of your stats a bit, you'll probably want to run from them. As a fighter, you'll definitely want to improve your combat skills as soon as possible, and this can be a bit of a painful process at first. Like I said, the only way to raise skills is to use them, and since you start off as a relative weakling, you'll need to heal up after pretty much every fight. There are only a couple of ways to do this. Healing potions are effective, but they're not cheap, and since your only real option for earning cash at this point is by killing stuff, you're likely to run out of them before you accumulate enough wealth to buy more. The much better option is to sleep in the enchanted meadow north of town called Arana's Peace. This fully replenishes your health, and unlike the inn back in Spielberg, it's free. Problem is, you can only sleep here in the evening, and if you lose 90% of your health in the first fight of the day, which you will, you're going to have to fill in a lot of time before you can sleep again. Yes, this game has a day-night cycle, another relatively sophisticated element for the late 80s. Some of the stronger monsters only appear at night, and if you're playing as a thief, you'll want to wait for the cover of darkness before you commit any nefarious deeds. There's also one quest in the game that has a time limit and involves being in a specific place at a specific time, which can kind of be a problem if you accept the quest without being adequately prepared, because it's very easy to completely screw yourself over and make it impossible to complete, which leads to certain death. More about that later. In truth, Quest for Glory is a bit more forgiving than a lot of 80s adventure games. Irrevocable certain death scenarios are rare, but you're still strongly advised to keep a number of different save game slots active. Anyway, there are a couple of things you can do to fill in the time before you can sleep again. You can work at the castle stables once a day for the pitiful reward of 5 silvers, or 1 eighth the cost of a single healing potion. For me though, the real reward is the music that plays in this section. Even rendered as primitively as it is here, I still think it's a real banger, as all the cool kids are saying these days. Anyway, if you're a fighter, you can also pay the Weapon Master for training, and you're really, really going to want to do this, because it's easily the best way to increase your combat skills and doesn't actually drain your health. Unfortunately, this too is a once a day activity, and it actually costs a whole gold, which is twice what you can earn from working in the stables. And that's capitalism for you. Or feudalism in this case, I guess. And unfortunately, those are the only reliable ways to pass time efficiently. You can wander around the place looking at things, asking about stuff and fulfilling minor quest objectives, such as trading a heap of apples to the frost troll in exchange for a mysterious glowing crystal, but you only need to do those things once and it's going to take quite a few days worth of combat and training before you're strong enough to take on the game's first real challenge. So I ended up spending a lot of real world time just running from screen to screen trying to burn up some in-game time. Quite a tedious process and not exactly compelling gameplay. After a while though, there comes a point where combat can be self-sustaining. Goblins drop a small amount of cash when you kill them, brigands a little more, and eventually you'll be able to collect enough gold to buy sufficient healing potions and not rely on sleeping at the Enchanted Meadow. And once you've reached that point, it's probably time to focus on completing the first main quest objective, finding the Baron's lost son. Of course, if you're doing a blind playthrough of the game, there's no real indication that this is the main first objective you should be pursuing. You've just got the notice board in the Adventurer's Guild with a bunch of quests uh, clamouring for your attention, but with the benefit of 30 years worth of hindsight, assisted by Ye Olde Hint Book, I know that what I need to do is get my combat skills to a level where I can take down the ogre in front of the cave near the Enchanted Meadow. Once you reach that level, this fight, like every other fight in the game, can be won by mashing the attack key. Stab the hairy bastard in his big fat stomach enough times and he'll keel over, 
leaving behind a treasure chest that you can force open for a bit of extra cash. Venture into the cave and you'll see a bear lurking in the darkness. Your first instinct might be to kill it, that's certainly what I did the first time I reached this point, and this is another example of why multiple save points are valuable. Thing is, that bear is in fact the Baron's lost son, captured and transformed by a malevolent and powerful, but rather tiny, kobold. Dealing with this kobold is another prime example of how the three different classes allow you to take a different approach. All classes can take it down in combat, but unless you're a fighter, it's going to take some serious grinding and leveling up before that point. Even as a fighter, it's a tough encounter and is a very rare instance of combat that takes place in the world, as it were, and not in the typical combat over the shoulder view. Magic users, on the other hand, have the option to simply cast a spell to levitate the key to the bear's chains off the kobold's neck, while thieves can sneak around behind the kobold and deftly pickpocket the necessary item. Well, not pickpocket, I guess, more pick neck. Either way, with the key in hand, you can release the baronet, who turns out to be a bit of a dick. Still, it's definitely worth saving him, because you finally get to meet the Baron himself, not to mention a thick wad of cash as a reward. With this, you can buy some heavy armor and maybe a couple of healing potions to help the grind go a bit easier. There's one particular spot that seems tailor-made for grinding, and now is the time when it starts becoming really useful. Go to this spot and fight the goblins, and every time you successfully complete an encounter, the next time around you'll fight one extra contender, up to a limit of maybe a dozen. Goblins should be pretty easy sword fodder by this point, so it's a quick and effective way to level up and get a bit of spare change by looting their pitiful corpses. The thing is though, combat skills aren't really required all that much for the rest of the game. There's one more tough encounter that can't be avoided as a fighter, but other than that, combat is pretty much optional. And so Heroes Quest was the first game where I discovered another of the joys of RPGs, unnecessarily grinding enough levels to make even the toughest of bosses keel over as soon as you glance in their direction. As a kid, I spent many hours fighting the toughest monsters, farming materials and leveling up, and decades later I'm still a sucker for that sort of futile busy work in games. Truly, this is where my love of making a number on a character sheet go up by one was born. These days though, I don't quite have the patience, so I'm going to proceed through the game as quickly as the mechanics allow. There are three main objectives left. Get rid of the witch Baba Yaga, stop the brigand attacks, and find the Baron's daughter. These quests turn out to be inextricably linked, so first let's focus on Baba Yaga. Go to her fabled chicken leg cottage and she'll turn you into a frog and threaten to eat you if you don't do her bidding. Turns out what she wants is a mandrake root, and this is where it's possible to completely screw yourself over and softlock the game if you're not careful, so you really want to keep one save game from before you set foot in a cottage. Thing is, you're now on a strict in-game time limit to get the mandrake root, and doing so requires you to meet certain conditions. Firstly, it has to be harvested in the graveyard at midnight. Second, and more significantly, you need to have some undead unguents on hand, or the ghosts that haunt the graveyard will simply suck the life from your defenseless body. The healer sells the unguents you need, but it's not cheap, and if you don't have the gold on hand, there's a reasonable chance you won't be able to acquire it before the time limit runs out, whereupon Baba Yaga simply teleports you to her and boils you in her pot. So it really is best to already have the unguents before encountering the witch. This is a lesson I learned the hard way over 30 years ago, and which I unfortunately had to learn again very recently. At least this time I had plenty of old save games to go back to. Incidentally, my PC back then had no hard drive, so to save games I had to take out the game disc, put in another floppy with some free space, save the game, then put the game disc back in. And if I wanted to load a game, I had to do pretty much the same thing. Not too dissimilar to a memory card system I guess, but at least with them you don't have to keep swapping discs back and forth and it became a real problem for me when my disk drive developed some sort of fault and wouldn't realize you'd changed a disk unless you first made a check for a disk when there wasn't one inserted. So that meant to save a game, I had to take out the game disk, make the computer check to see if there was a disk in the drive, cancel the error message that came up, put in the save disk, save the game, take out the save disk, make the computer check if there was a disk in the drive, cancel the error message that came up, and then put the game disk back in. It was a process and perhaps explains why I wasn't so diligent about keeping lots of different save games back in those days. Anyway, after applying the unguent, we can acquire the Mandrake Root and bring it back to Baba Yaga, who is satisfied for now. We'll be coming back to her though. For now it's the Brigands, and rescuing Elsa, the Baron's daughter. First thing you'll need is a Dispel Potion from the Dryad. There are a few ingredients you'll need to acquire. Green fur you can just get by politely asking these meeps, whatever the hell a meep is. Then some fairy dust you can get from the pixies, also by asking politely, and dancing. 
Finally, you need to get the seed that these uh, spitting seed pod things are throwing around. Here's another example of the different options open to different classes. Fighters can throw a rock to knock it out of the air, thieves can climb up to a position where they can grab it as it passes by, and magic users can cast a spell to capture it in midair and pull it towards them. It's functionally the same as the healer's ring quest from before, but it was still kind of cool in my eyes. Now with those ingredients gathered, the dryad will make you a dispel potion. Why do you need it? You don't even really know at this point, but hey, it's something the game told you to do, so you better do it. Now it's off to the brigand fortress. There are a couple of ways you can gain entry to their hideout. The easiest way, arguably, and the way you're really supposed to do it, is to wait at a certain spot so you can overhear a couple of brigands talking about a secret passage and the code word you need to use to get through safely. That's a smart way of doing it. The stupid way, i.e. the way I chose to go with this time, is to just run straight up to their main entrance and sprint through the hail of arrows that they rain down upon you. If you have enough health, you will survive, probably. And then it's time for maybe the toughest combat encounter in the game, with the Minotaur that guards the gate to their stronghold. Don't go into the battle with low health like I did, you won't last long. Drink a couple of healing potions beforehand though, mash the up button as usual to attack, and hooray, the hardest enemy in the game defeated. Yeah, this was my first introduction to RPGs and I still love it, but the combat hasn't really stood the test of time. Well, I mean, that said, there are still plenty of RPGs that you can get through without doing much more than just spamming the attack command, I guess. Anyway, that's the last time you'll be needing to engage in combat. Unless you want to go and kill the troll that guards the secret passage I ignored earlier, which I do. Killing it whets your harvested beard, which can be traded at the healers for a couple of health potions, but given I am now truly done with combat for this playthrough, it's not exactly worth it. From here on, it's just puzzles of the traditional 80s Sierra type. There are about 20 different things that will kill you in this screen alone, including tripwires that are genuinely impossible to see with these limited graphics, so you're basically going to be doing a lot of saving and loading until you trial and error your way through. And that's not too bad today, but remember, when I first played this game I was using a slow PC with a dodgy disk drive. All that saving and loading was a nightmare. Next up, it's an extended Three Stooges reference, which went completely over my head as a child, and a lot more trial and error as you try to figure out the correct sequence of actions to trap them behind the table as you flee through the door behind them. You need to lock one door, block the other, push over the candlestick at the right time, get on the table at the right time, and then swing right through them in a most heroic and comedic manner. Easy when you know how, and rather amusing, but man it was tough to figure out. And there was more saving and loading. And finally there's this room, proving that the brigands had MC Escher as an interior designer. It's confusing as hell and involves yet more trial and error as you figure out which doors take you where and which sections of the floor will collapse and send you to an instant death, but you'll get there eventually. Or sooner if you resort to the hint book, which I'm pretty sure I did back in the day. And so we come at last to a confrontation with the brigand leader. It really doesn't last too long though. Use the dispel potion and it turns out the brigand leader was Elsa all along. This shocking twist might have had more impact back in the day if I'd had the wherewithal to follow the plot and not just the hint book. Although to be honest the narrative isn't really super sophisticated, certainly not by today's standards. Oh well, only one loose end remains, Baba Yaga. There's a mirror we can acquire here in the brigand leader's room, and if we head back to Baba Yaga's hut, we can use it to turn her own magic against her. It's simple, it's effective, it's the last major objective of the game completed. Return to the castle and that's it, game complete. You've become a hero, everyone's happy, and it's time to fly off into the sequel. A sequel which I have never played, but which I really, really should at some point. I mean, I've been wanting to play it for over three decades, and thanks to GOG I've got all the games in the series sitting on my hard drive somewhere. I've even got the spiritual successor reboot, Hero U, Rogue to Redemption, and that looks kind of cool I guess. Maybe one day I'll get around to them. For now though, there's still a bit more worth discussing about the first Hero's Quest. For starters, there's a little bit more to the different classes than just combat abilities and a few different ways to complete quests, so let's take a closer look at some of them. First the magic user. He can cast the open spell here to gain the calm spell, which is useful if you want to run away from an enemy before it can initiate combat with you. It's no good casting it once combat has started though, because as the manual states, if you cast calm on a Saurus that's busy fighting you, it will just calmly tear off your arm and eat it. I thought that was the height of humour when I was 10. Being a wizard also gives you access to a mini game here in Erasmus's tower. Any class can enter this place, but only a magic user can play Mage's Maze, so long as they've acquired all the necessary spells. Now I'm not going to lie, I don't really know how this game works. 
You've got to use your spells to somehow help your little guy navigate his way through the maze before the other guy gets him, but I've never figured out how to do it. To be fair, I think the version I had as a kid was basically unplayable, as the four color graphics didn't seem to render the game screen properly, so I never really bothered with it. And I'm not going to bother with it now. It is a nifty addition for the magic user though, even if I never figured it out. The Thief, on the other hand, has some exclusive content that I very much liked. If you wait until nightfall, you can use your lockpicking abilities to enter a couple of houses in town and steal their stuff. This is highly lucrative, but also kind of dangerous. Fortunately, death, as always, can be remedied by a swift quick load. Well, as I've mentioned before, there was nothing quick about the loading back in the day, but now it's a welcome luxury. As a thief, you also have access to the Thieves' Guild, a room located under the tavern. You need to come here if you want to fence your stolen goods, and it's also a cool little dagger-throwing minigame. Well, it was cool back then. The mechanics are so simple that these days it's utterly trivial. But eh, so is life, am I right? So these are the main differences between the classes. Like I say, it's not exactly super sophisticated divergent gameplay. But man, it seemed so awesome back then. A game you can play three different ways? This will keep me occupied for years, I thought. And I wasn't really wrong, although mostly that was due to my inability to figure out how to do most things before we got the hint book. But hey, that's 80 Sierra for you. Now before I go, I do want to just take a quick look at the 1992 VGA remake. Like I said, with just three years between the original and its remake, that might seem like a ridiculously short time frame, even compared to something like the Last of Us remaster. But technology moved quickly then. So now, bask in the glory of three years of advancements in PC technology. And honestly, I like how it looks. I'll still always prefer the pixelated goodness and limited colour palette of the original, but that's mainly just nostalgia speaking. If I'd had access to this remake in 1992, I would have freaked out with excitement. The interface is now more in the point-and-click style, and yeah, I do miss the text passing of the original, but this is probably more user-friendly. And combat is... well, it doesn't seem to have changed that much. I still seem to be able to win just by hitting the attack button. All things considered, it's fine, but I'm happy to stick to the 80s version. Well, that's pretty much everything I have to say about Heroes Quest, or as the copyright lawyers would prefer, Quest for Glory. It's one of those games that's tough for me to judge objectively, as it was just so important to me personally at the time I played it, and hugely influential in shaping my tastes in games. Fortunately, I've never pretended to be objective, so as long as I've got across the impact it had on me as a kid, that's good enough for me. So until next time, get off my lawn.